Hello and welcome everyone to our Morbius review. This time we're going to start with a no spoiler section and then move on to the actual plot and that gosh darn post credit scene. And as always, the chapters are in the description. First off, just to be clear, this movie does not take place within the MCU. This is the Sonyverse where Venom is also from. Now the two of them are of course not entirely disconnected, but we'll get to that once we get to spoilers. Okay, so in the movie we basically follow the story of Dr. Michael Morbius, a medical scientist who specializes in everything blood. His interest in blood is hugely influenced by his medical condition, as he suffers from a rare blood disease which he wants to cure even if the price is, let's say, morally questionable. He eventually manages to find a cure, but finds out that this comes at the hefty price of him now being basically a vampire and so you know he has to deal with that so if you're into vampires and you're looking for a fun flick to spend the evening you might find yourself liking this movie and if you've already seen it and you do like it great that's awesome but if you haven't seen it and want to i wouldn't go into it with all too high expectations i think if you liked venom and had a good time with it then you'll probably have a good time with this one too Okay, so since this is pretty much all I can say here without spoiling anything, if you haven't seen it yet, beware, because we're now going into spoiler territory in 3, 2, 1. Okay, so let's start off with some general thoughts. How was it? Is it any good? Well, for me at least, it was a bit of a letdown. But let's kick things off with some of the good stuff, shall we? So in general, I think the effects of Morbius' powers were pretty good. I really like the face transformations, and especially the ears and eyes thing they get going on with their echolocation. That was pretty cool. I also appreciated that they came up with the sciencey explanation to justify Morbius' actions when studying the bats and coming up with his initial cure. I thought that was pretty good too. And I also think Jared Leto and the general cast did a pretty solid job of bringing their characters to life. The international waters choke was pretty nice and the first boat fight was also pretty cool. So basically, up until Morbius left the ship, this could still have been a pretty good movie. But sadly, that kinda already brings me to the bad stuff. Okay, so if you left this movie with a bunch of questions in your head, honestly, I wouldn't blame you. Why did not a single bat go for his blood if the blood attracts them in the first place? And even worse, if they would have gone for it, what about infections? Isn't he supposed to be a doctor? Why is that hospital hallway lit so stupidly? Yes, I get it, we want to do the horror thing here, but for real, this has to be the most inconvenient way to light anything. What was that whole subplot with the forgers? Was that really just so that he could have a secret lab? And on that note, can a lab that's been used for forgery really be also used to create a vampire healing slash killing serum just by adding some stuff that Martine was able to carry on her own? And speaking of Martine, how did Milo not put together that an unsurprised Martine must have known that he got the serum and that Morbius was the only one who could have told her. And what was the point of the FBI investigation if it didn't lead anywhere? Will we ever get answers to any of these? Bet your ass we won't. Smaller stupid things aside though, if we go a bit deeper, the main victim here I guess is Michael Morbius himself. See, after watching this movie, I don't necessarily think that I get the character. I mean, think about the new Batman movie. I can picture having a full conversation with this Bruce Wayne, because I understand what drives him and how he talks and thinks, and I just don't get the same feeling for Morbius here. For example, why did he not accept the Nobel Prize? Seems like a pretty big deal, right? So why? Does he not value it? But then why go in the first place? Does he go because he holds a personal grudge and wants to rub it into someone's face? Does he want to draw attention to his cause? We don't know and this moment could have really been used to show us a little bit more about him. This is mainly because his scenes with the three characters he talks to throughout this movie don't really carry much information about the character other than that he's sick and that he wants to find a cure. The only other thing that's brought up again and again is the whole few versus the many thing that he's got going on with Milo, which they tell us to highlight their bond, but we don't really get to see them interacting a whole lot as the best friends they are before Morbius comes up with his cure. And for Milo, he's also his own kind of puzzle with only one piece. First off, his name's not Milo. That's right, his actual name is of course Locius. But young Michael Morbius decides that his name is Milo because of all the other ones that came before him. The thing is, nobody ever questions or challenges this. Heck, even Dr. Nicholas just rolls with it, so at some point it just sticks. I mean, the man is legit living in his 30s with this name. The best part is that Milo even makes this sentimental thing about it in his last words before his death, as if it was super gracious of Morbius to call him by a different name all this time. Then of course we have the same issue with Milo as we have for Michael, in that we never really get to see what he's all about before his transformation. What are his interests? What are his beliefs? What does he do for a living? He's not a lawyer, that's for sure. And again, we generally don't get a whole lot of character building between the two of them as best friends before they turn. Which brings us to the next question. How did Milo turn in the first place? I mean, sure, he got the serum on probably the same day he got Michael the artificial blood, but he doesn't know how to apply it. 
and the only other person who does is Martin, who at this point is in the hospital. When Morbius got his serum, it seemed like it was this whole complicated deal with him getting it ejected into his spine. So I guess the whole thing's not as easy as ramming the needle into your thigh. When Malo then does end up with his powers, he's very quick to use them. Like he very quickly kills that newspaper guy. Sure, it's played off as if he was just being protective of Michael, but honestly, I think he was just waiting for an excuse here. Morbius of course sees this after his escape from prison and attacks him. Milo now sees himself as above human, while Michael sees the vampirism as just another disease that he has to cure, so they end up fighting down to the subway station. And man, come on, I like to see the actual fight when it takes place. Like sure, I get it, they're fast and all, but we had our fun with obscure attacks in the boat scene already. Now they're both fighting in bright subway light and I have no idea what they're doing because all I can see is the stupid color that they leave behind. I wanna see the actual fight. The next part is also great though, since again, Morbius attacked Milo because he killed one guy. Then, in the subway, he kills five police officers and that's when Morbius is just like, yeah, I don't actually wanna fight you. And then he just bolts and flies straight into an oncoming train? Great stuff. Oh yeah, and by the way, they do play quite fast and loose with the whole hiding thing. First, he should be hiding because of all the boat murders. That's why he literally jumps ship. Then we all of a sudden don't care because we want to visit Martin. That's got consequences. That was good. We go to prison and mind you, his face is now all over the news. He escapes and then we briefly hide again before publicly attacking and fighting Milo to the subway. Then we hide again and meet Martin on the bus. But then we go out for coffee publicly and then we hide again in the new lab just to fight publicly afterwards. Okay, but let's move on to the climax here. The fight between Morbius and Milo. Now we obviously know that Morbius, prior to this, created the healing slash killing serum that he wanted to use on himself or on Milo. Like when he created it, he had that line towards Martin that kind of implied that it was for him. Are we just going to ignore the whole Milo problem now? But maybe it was meant for Milo because, you know, we don't want to fight him, so we're just going to kill him. Cool. So they fight and Morbius ends up winning because of his kinship with the bats. Awesome. Did Milo have that too? Maybe, but apparently not. Was it a satisfying conclusion to the story? At least for me, you guessed it, it was not. There were no real stakes involving, for example, a loved one because Martin is dead by that point, or so we believe. They didn't even use the blood clock anymore to build some tension and the bats thing wasn't really earned because Morbius didn't do anything for it. He just kind of found out about it the same way you'd find out about a Cheeto in your hair after falling asleep on the couch. Yeah, and then Morbius just flies away, straight into the post credit scene. Oh yeah, and Martin is of course a vampire now as well. Because it works with Mobius' blood too, I guess. Damn, I cannot wait for the sequel. The thing is, if we really break it down, you can actually see that there is a basic structure in this movie that could work. We basically have Morbius who's sick, and therefore he wants to find a cure. He finds one, but it comes at a terrible cost. Milo sees him, but only sees him well, and thus doesn't listen to Morbius when he tells him that the cure is too dangerous. While Morbius is in prison, Milo takes it on his own and the two of them end up in conflict with one another since Morbius sees his powers as another disease that he needs to fix while Milo wants to claim his newfound seat at the top of the food chain. In general, this is solid enough to work. But the problem is that the final conflict lies between Michael, the champion for humans, and Milo, the self-described next step in evolution. And we need to see how their clashing beliefs necessitate their conflict and how Morbius is working to overcome it in order for it to have any impact. Give us one more scene that tells us who they are as people, why they suffer internally and what drives them. If we could focus on these characters more, develop their relationships and define more clearly how they have to be at odds with each other, the whole thing could end up as a way better story. And if we want this to be a good superhero story as well, we're going to need some more stakes in the final battle. Have Morbius lose some ground because for example he's out of blood. And again, I get the bad idea. But I think it would also have been more meaningful if Morbius had to somehow work for that. Like for example Iron Man, who first actively had to find out about and then fix high altitude freezing before he could use it to win over Iron Monger. If characters overcome their suffering by learning something and then use that to win, that's satisfying. But that has to be earned, and that's not what we got here. Okay, and then of course there was the post credit scene. Adrian Toomes aka The Vulture is transported into this universe because he knows who Peter Parker is and thus the spell has transported him, similar to the other villains of No Way Home, into this universe, I guess? Yeah, no, it makes no sense. Why doesn't he just forget like MJ or Ned or Doctor Strange? Anyway, he creates a new suit, pretty smart guy this contract turned pilot, and meets Morbius, who doesn't fly but drive for some reason. Toomes thinks he's here because of Spider-Man, however he came to that conclusion, and he wants to team up to do some good. 
Morbius, of course, finds this intriguing. So on the face, I can see how that could make sense to someone. But considering that Toombs himself finished his arc in Homecoming on good terms with Spidey, and Morbius in general is acting more as a sort of hero slash anti-hero, and considering that Sony desperately wants to get their own universe on track with their Spidey villains, I'm really interested in that leap of character motivation required for the both of them to turn into the villains that I think Sony wants them to be in their upcoming crossover. Oh yeah, and also shout out to Daniel Espinosa, the director of this movie, who straight up spoiled the entire film a solid week before it came out. I think at this point we owe Tom Holland and Mark Ruffalo an apology. But what do you guys think? Did Mobius live up to your expectations? Are you happy with what we got? Leave us your thoughts in the comments down below and subscribe so you can join us next time when we explore the canon of your favorite cosmic. Goodbye!